This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 21 It was after sun-up now, but we went right on and didn't tie up. The king and the duke turned out by and by, looking pretty rusty. But after they jumped overboard and took a swim, it chippered them up a good deal. After breakfast the king he took a seat on the corner of the raft, and pulled off his boots and rolled up his breeches, and let his legs dangle in the water, so as to be comfortable, and lit his pipe and went to getting his Romeo and Juliet by heart. When he had got it pretty good, him and the duke began to practice it together. The duke had to learn him over and over again how to say every speech, and he made him sigh, and put his hand on his heart. And after a while he said he'd done it pretty well. Only, he says, you mustn't bellow out Romeo that way, like a bull. You must say it soft and sweet and languishy. So, Romeo, that is the idea. For Juliet's a dear, sweet, mere child of a girl, you know, and she doesn't bray like a jackass. Well, next they got out a couple of long swords that the Duke made out of oak laths, and begun to practice the sword-fight. The Duke called himself Richard the Third, and the way they laid on and pranced around the raft was grand to see. But by and by the King tripped and fell overboard, and after that they took a rest, and had a talk about all kinds of adventures they'd had in other times along the river. After dinner the Duke says, well, Capet, we'll want to make this a first-class show, you know, so I guess we'll add a little more to it. We want a little something to answer encores with, anyway. What's encores, Bilgewater? The Duke told him, and then says, I'll answer by doing the Highland Fling, or the Sailor's Hornpipe, and you, well, let me see. Oh, I've got it. You can do Hamlet's Soliloquy. Hamlet's which? Hamlet's soliloquy, you know, the most celebrated thing in Shakespeare. Ah, it's sublime, sublime, always fetches the house. I haven't got it in the book. I've only got one volume. But I reckon I can piece it out from memory. I'll just walk up and down a minute and see if I can call it back from Recollections Vaults. So he went to marching up and down, thinking, and frowning horrible every now and then. Then he would hoist up his eyebrows. Next he would squeeze his hand on his forehead and stagger back and kind of moan. Next he would sigh, and next he'd let on to drop a tear. It was beautiful to see him. By and by he got it. He told us to give attention. Then he strikes a most noble attitude, with one leg shoved forwards and his arms stretched away up, and his head tilted back, looking up at the sky. And then he begins to rip and rave and grit his teeth. And after that, all through his speech, he howled and spread around and swelled up his chest and just knocked the spots out of any acting ever I see before. This is the speech. I learned it easy enough while he was learning it to the king. To be or not to be, that is the bare bodkin. That makes calamity of so long life. For who would fartles bear? till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane, but that the fear of something after death murders the innocent sleep, great nature's second course, and makes us rather sling the arrows of outrageous fortune than fly to others that we know not of. There's the respect must give us pause. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking. I would thou couldst. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong? and proud man's contumely, the law's delay, and the quietus which his pangs might take, in the dead waste and middle of the night, when churchyards yawn, in customary suits of solemn black, but that the undiscovered country from whose bourn no traveller returns, breathes forth contagion on the world, and thus the native hue of resolution, like the poor cat in the adage, is sicklied over with care and all the clouds that lowered o'er our housetops. With this regard their currents turn awry, 
and lose the name of action. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. But soft you, the fair Ophelia, Ope not thy ponderous and marble jaws, but get thee to a nunnery. Go! Well, the old man, he liked that speech, and he mighty soon got it so he could do it first-rate. It seemed like he was just born for it, and when he had his hand in and was excited, it was perfectly lovely the way he would rip and tear and rear up behind when he was getting it off. The first chance we got, the Duke he had some showbills printed, and after that, for two or three days as we floated along, the raft was a most uncommon lively place, for there weren't nothing but sword-fighting and rehearsing, as the Duke called it, going on all the time. One morning, when we were pretty well down the state of Arkansas, we came in sight of a little one-horse town in a big bend, so we tied up about three-quarters of a mile above it, in the mouth of a creek which was shut in like a tunnel by the cypress trees, and all of us but Jim took the canoe and went down there to see if there was any chance in that place for our show. We struck it mighty lucky. There was going to be a circus there that afternoon, and the country people was already beginning to come in, in all kinds of old shackly wagons and on horses. The circus would leave before night, so our show would have a pretty good chance. The Duke he hired the courthouse, and we went around and stuck up our bills. They read like this. Shakespearean Revival. Wonderful attraction. For one night only. The world-renowned tragedians David Garrick the Younger, of Drury Lane Theatre, London, and Edmund Kane the Elder, of the Royal Haymarket Theatre, Whitechapel, Pudding Lane, Piccadilly, London, and the Royal Continental Theatres in their sublime Shakespearean spectacle entitled the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo, played by Mr. Garrick. Juliet, played by Mr. Kane. Assisted by the whole strength of the company. New costumes, new scenes, new appointments. Also, the thrilling, masterly, and blood-curdling broadsword conflict in Richard the Third. Richard the Third, played by Mr. Garrett. Richmond, played by Mr. Kane. Also, by special request, Hamlet's Immortal Soliloquy, by the illustrious Kane, done by him three hundred consecutive nights in Paris, for one night only, on account of imperative European engagements, admission twenty-five cents, children and servants ten cents. Then we went loafing around town. The stores and houses was most all old, shackly, dried-up frame concerns that hadn't ever been painted. They was set up three or four feet above ground on stilts, so as to be out of reach of the water when the river was overflowed. The houses had little gardens around them, but they didn't seem to raise hardly anything in them but jimson weeds and sunflowers and ash piles, and old curled-up boots and shoes and pieces of bottles and rags and played-out tinware. The fences was made of different kinds of boards, nailed on at different times, and they leaned every which way, and had gates that didn't generally have but one hinge, a leather one. Some of the fences had been whitewashed some time or another, but the Duke said it was in Columbus's time, like enough. There was generally hogs in the garden and people driving them out. All the stores was along one street. They had white domestic awnings in front and the country people hitched their horses to the awning posts. There was empty dry-goods boxes under the awnings, and loafers roosting on them all day long, whittling them with their barlow knives, and chawing tobacco, and gaping and yawning and stretching, a mighty ornery lot. They generally had on yellow straw hats, most as wide as an umbrella, but didn't wear no coats nor waistcoats. They called one another Bill, and Buck, and Hank, and Joe, and Andy, and talked lazy and drawly, and used considerable many cuss-words. There was as many as one loafer leaning up against every awning post, and he most always had his hands in his breeches pockets, except when he fetched them out to lend a chaw of tobacco, or scratch. What a body was hearing amongst them all the time was, "'Give me a chaw of tobacco, Hank.' 
I can't. I ain't got but one chaw left. Ask Bill. Maybe Bill, he gives him a chaw. Maybe he lies and says he ain't got none. Some of them kinds of loafers never has a cent in the world, nor a chaw of tobacco of their own. They get all their chawing by borrowing. They say to a fellow, I wish you'd lend me a chaw, Jack. I just this minute give Ben Thompson the last chaw I had. Which is a lie pretty much every time. He don't fool nobody but a stranger. But Jack ain't no stranger, so he says, You give him a chaw, did you? So did your sister's cat's grandmother. You pay me back the chaws you already borrowed off of me, Leif Buckner. Then I'll loan you one or two ton of it, and won't charge you no back interest, nother. Well, I did pay back some of it once. Yes, you did, about six chaws. You'd borrow a store tobacco and pay back niggerhead. Store tobacco is flat black plug, but these fellows mostly chaws the natural leaf twisted. When they borrow a chaw, they don't generally cut it off with a knife, but set the plug in between their teeth and gnaw with their teeth, and tug at the plug with their hands till they get it in two. Then sometimes the one that owns the tobacco looks mournful at it when it's handed back and says, sarcastic, Here, give me the chaw, you take the plug. All the streets and lanes was just mud. They want nothing else but mud. Mud as black as tar, and nigh about a foot deep in some places, and two or three inches deep in all the places. The hogs loafed and grunted round everywheres. You'd see a muddy sow and a litter of pigs come lazing along the street, and wallop herself right down in the way where folks had to walk around her. And she'd stretch out and shut her eyes and wave her ears whilst the pigs was milking her and look as happy as if she was on salary. And pretty soon you'd hear a loafer sing out, Hi! So, boy, sick him, Tyke! And away the sow would go, squealing most horrible, with a dog or two swinging to each ear, and three or four dozen more coming. And then you'd see all the loafers get up and watch the thing out of sight, and laugh at the fun and look grateful for the noise. Then they'd settle back again until there was a dog fight. They couldn't anything wake them up all over, and make them happy all over, like a dog-fight, unless it might be putting turpentine on a stray dog and setting fire to him, or tying a tin pan to his tail and see him run himself to death. On the river front some of the houses was sticking out over the bank, and they was bowed and bent, and about ready to tumble in. The people had moved out of them. The bank was caved away under one corner of some others, and that corner was hanging over. People lived in them yet, but it was dangerous, because sometimes a strip of land as wide as a house caves in at a time. Sometimes a belt of land a quarter of a mile deep will start in and cave along and cave along till it all caves into the river in one summer. Such a town as that has to be always moving back and back and back because the river's always gnawing at it. The nearer it got to noon that day, the thicker and thicker was the wagons and horses in the streets, and more coming all the time. Families fetched their dinners with them from the country, and eat them in the wagons. There was considerable whiskey drinking going on, and I seen three fights. By and by somebody sings out, Here comes old Boggs, in from the country for his little old monthly drunk. Here he comes, boys. All the loafers looked glad. I reckon they was used to having fun out of bogs. One of them says, Wonder who's a going to chaw up this time. If he'd a chawed up all the men he's been a going to chaw up in the last twenty year, he'd have a considerable reputation now. Another one says, I wished old bogs had threatened me, cause then I'd know I weren't going to die for a thousand year. Boggs comes a tearing along on his horse, whooping and yelling like an engine, and singing out, Clear the track there, I'm on the wall path, and the path of coffins is a going to raise. He was drunk, and weaving about in his saddle. He was over fifty year old, and had a very red face. Everybody yelled at him, and laughed at him, and sassed him, and he sassed back, and said he'd attend to them, and lay them out in their regular turns. 
but he couldn't wait now because he'd come to town to kill old Colonel Sherburne, and his motto was, Meat first, and spoon vittles to top off on. He see me, and rode up and says, Where'd you come from, boy? You prepare to die? Then he rode on. I was scared, but a man says, He don't mean nothing. He's always a carrying on like that when he's drunk. He's the best naturedness old fool in Arkansas. Never hurt nobody, drunk nor sober. Boggs rode up before the biggest store in town, and bent his head down so he could see under the curtain of the awning, and yells, Come out here, Sherburn. Come out and meet the man you swindled. You're the hound I'm after, and I'm a-going to have you, too. So he went on, calling Sherburn everything he could lay his tongue to, a whole street packed with people listening and laughing and going on. By and by a proud-looking man, about fifty-five, and he was a heap the best-dressed man in that town, too, steps out of the store, and the crowd drops back on each side to let him come. He says to Boggs, mighty calm and slow, he says, I'm tired of this, but I'll endure it till one o'clock. Till one o'clock, mind, no longer. If you open your mouth against me only once after that time, you can't travel so far, but I will find you. Then he turns and goes in. The crowd looked mighty sober. Nobody stirred, and there weren't no more laughing. Boggs rode up Black Garden Sherburne as loud as he could yell, all down the street. Pretty soon back he comes and stops before the store, still keeping it up. Some men crowded around him and tried to get him to shut up, but he wouldn't. They told him it would be one o'clock in about fifteen minutes, and so he must go home. He must go right away. But it didn't do no good. He cussed away with all his might, and throwed his hat down in the mud and rode over it. And pretty soon away he went a-raging down the street again, with his gray hair a-flying. Everybody that could get a chance at him tried their best to coax him off of his horse so they could lock him up and get him sober. But it weren't no use. Up the street he would tear again and give Sherburne another cussing. By and by somebody says, Go for his daughter. Quick, go for his daughter. Sometimes he'll listen to her. If anybody can persuade him, she can. So somebody started on a run. I walked down street a ways and stopped. In about five or ten minutes here comes Boggs again, but not on his horse. He was a-reeling across the street towards me, bareheaded, with a friend on both sides of him, a hold of his arms, and hurrying him along. He was quiet and looked uneasy, and he weren't hanging back any, but was doing some of the hurrying himself. Somebody sings out, Boggs. I looked over there to see who had said it, and it was that Colonel Sherburne. He was standing perfectly still in the street, and had a pistol raised in his right hand, not aiming it, but holding it out with the barrel tilted up towards the sky. The same second I see a young girl coming on the run, and two men with her. Boggs and the men turned round to see who called him, and when they see the pistol, the men jumped to one side, and the pistol barrel come down slow and steady to a level, both barrels cocked. Boggs throws up both of his hands and says, Oh, Lord, don't shoot! Bang! goes the first shot, and he staggers back, clawing at the air. Bang! goes the second one, and he tumbles backwards onto the ground, heavy and solid, with his arms spread out. That young girl screamed out and comes rushing, and down she throws herself on her father, crying and saying, Oh, he's killed him! He's killed him! The crowd closed up around them, and shouldered and jammed one another, with their necks stretched, trying to see, and people on the inside trying to shove them back, and shouting, Back! Back! Give him air! Give him air! Colonel Sherburne, he tossed his pistol onto the ground, and turned around on his heels, and walked off. They took Boggs to a little drug store, the crowd pressing around just the same, and the whole town following and I rushed and got a good place at the window, where I was close to him and could see in. They laid him on the floor and put one large Bible under his head, and opened another one and spread it on his breast. 
but they tore open his shirt first, and I seen where one of the bullets went in. He made about a dozen long gasps, his breast lifting the Bible up when he drawed in his breath, and letting it down again when he breathed it out. And after that he laid still. He was dead. Then they pulled his daughter away from him, screaming and crying, and took her off. She was about sixteen, very sweet and gentle-looking, but awful pale and scared. Well, pretty soon the whole town was there, squirming and scrooging and pushing and shoving to get at the window and have a look. But people that had the places wouldn't give them up, and folks behind them was saying all the time, Say now, you've looked enough, you fellows. Tain't right and tain't fair for you to stay there all the time. Never give nobody a chance. Other folks has their rights as well as you. There was considerable jawing back, so I slid out, thinking maybe there was going to be trouble. The streets was full, and everybody was excited. Everybody that seen the shooting was telling how it happened, and there was a big crowd packed around each one of these fellows, stretching their necks and listening. One long, lanky man, with long hair and a big white-furred stove-pipe hat on the back of his head, and a crooked-handled cane, marked out the places on the ground where Boggs stood and where Sherburne stood, and the people following him around from one place to the other, and watching everything he done, and bobbing their heads to show they understood and stooping a little and resting their hands on their thighs to watch him mark the places on the ground with his cane. And then he stood up straight and stiff where Sherburne had stood, frowning and having his hat brimmed down over his eyes, and sung out, Boggs, and then fetched his cane down slow to a level, and says, Bang, staggered backwards, says, Bang, again, and fell down flat on his back. The people that had seen the thing said he'd done it perfect, said it was just exactly the way it all happened. Then as much as a dozen people got out their bottles and treated him. Well, by and by, somebody said Sherburne ought to be lynched. In about a minute everybody was saying it, so away they went, mad and yelling, and snatching down every clothesline they come to, to do the hanging with. End of the chapter. Chapter 22 they swarmed up towards Sherburne's house, a whooping and raging like injuns, and everything had to clear the way or get run over and tromped to mush, and it was awful to see. Children was heeling it ahead of the mob, screaming and trying to get out of the way, and every window along the road was full of women's heads, and there was nigger boys in every tree, and bucks and winches looking over every fence and as soon as the mob would get nearly to them they would break and scattle back out of reach. Lots of the women and girls was crying and taken on, scared most to death. They swarmed up in front of Sherbert's palings as thick as they could jam together, and you couldn't hear yourself think for the noise. It was a little twenty-foot yard. Some sung out, "'Tear down the fence! Tear down the fence!' Then there was a racket of ripping and tearing and smashing, and down she goes, and the front wall of the crowd begins to roll in like a wave. Just then, Sherburn steps out onto the roof of his little front porch, with a double-barrel gun in his hand, and takes his stand, perfectly calm and deliberate, not saying a word. The racket stopped, and the wave sucked back. Sherburn never said a word just stood there, looking down. The stillness was awful creepy and uncomfortable. Sherburne run his eyes slow along the crowd, and wherever it struck the people tried a little to outgaze him, but they couldn't. They dropped their eyes and looked sneaky. Then pretty soon Sherburne sort of laughed, not the pleasant kind, but the kind that makes you feel like when you are eating bread that's got sand in it. Then he says, slow and scornful, The idea of you lynching anybody. It's amusing. The idea of you thinking you had pluck enough to lynch a man. Because you're brave enough to tar and feather poor friendless cast-out women that come along here, 
Did that make you think you had grit enough to lay your hands on a man? Why, a man's safe in the hands of ten thousand of your kind, as long as it's daytime and you're not behind him. Do I know you? I know you clear through was born and raised in the South, and I've lived in the North, so I know the average all around. The average man's a coward. In the North he lets anybody walk over him that wants to, and goes home and prays for a humble spirit to bear it. In the South one man all by himself has stopped a stage full of men in the daytime and robbed the lot. Your newspapers call you a brave people so much that you think you are braver than any other people, whereas you're just as brave, and no braver. Why don't your juries hang murderers? Because they're afraid the man's friends will shoot them in the back, in the dark, and it's just what they would do. So they always acquit, and then a man goes in the night, with a hundred masked cowards at his back, and lynches the rascal. Your mistake is that you didn't bring a man with you. That's one mistake, and the other is that you didn't come in the dark and fetch your masks. You brought part of a man, Buck Harkness there, and if you hadn't had him to start you, you'd have taken it out in blowing. You didn't want to come. The average man don't like trouble and danger. You don't like trouble and danger. But if only half a man, like Buck Harkness there, shouts, Lynch him, lynch him, you're afraid to back down, afraid you'll be found out to be what you are, cowards. And so you raise a yell, and hang yourselves on to that half a man's coat-tail, and come raging up here, swearing what big things you're going to do. The pitifulest thing out is a mob. That's what an army is, a mob. They don't fight with courage that's born in them, but with courage that's borrowed from their mass, and from their officers. But a mob without any man at the head of it is beneath pitifulness. Now the thing for you to do is to droop your tails and go home and crawl in a hole. If any real lynching's going to be done, it will be done in the dark, southern fashion. And when they come, they'll bring their masks and fetch a man along. Now leave, and take your half a man with you. Tossing his gun up across his left arm and cocking it when he says this. The crowd washed back sudden, and then broke all apart and went tearing off every which way, and Buck Harkness he healed it after them, looking tolerable cheap. I could have stayed if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. I went to the circus and loafed around the back side till the watchman went by, and then dived in under the tent. I had my twenty-dollar gold piece and some other money, but I reckoned I'd better save it, because there ain't no telling how soon you're going to need it, away from home and amongst strangers that way. You can't be too careful. I ain't opposed to spending money on circuses when there ain't no other way, but there ain't no use in wasting it on them. It was a real bully circus. It was the splendidest sight that ever was when they all come riding in, two by two, a gentleman and lady side by side, the men just in their drawers and undershirts, and no shoes nor stirrups and resting their hands on their thighs easy and comfortable. There must have been a twenty of them, and every lady with a lovely complexion, and perfectly beautiful, and looking just like a gang of real sure-enough queens, and dressed in clothes that cost millions of dollars and just littered with diamonds. It was a powerful fine sight. I never seen anything so lovely. And then one by one they got up and stood, and went a-weaving around the ring so gentle and wavy and graceful, the men looking ever so tall and airy and straight, with their heads bobbing and skimming along, away up there under the tent roof, and every lady's rose-leafy dress flapping soft and silky around her hips, and she looking like the most loveliest parasol. And then faster and faster they went, all of them dancing, first one foot out in the air and then the other, the horses leaning more and more, and the ringmaster going round and round the center pole, cracking his whip and shouting, Hi! Hi! And the clown cracking jokes behind him. 
and by and by all hands dropped the reins, and every lady put her knuckles on her hips, and every gentleman folded his arms, and then how the horses did lean over and hump themselves. And so one after the other they all skipped off into the ring, and made the sweetest bow I ever see, and then scampered out, and everybody clapped their hands and just about went wild. Well, all through the circus they done the most astonishing things, and all the time that clown carried on so it most killed the people. The ringmaster could never say a word to him, but he was back at him quick as a wink, with the funniest things a body ever said, and how he ever could think of so many of them, and so sudden and so pat, was what I could no way understand. Why, I couldn't have thought of them in a year. And by and by a drunk man tried to get into the ring, said he wanted to ride, said he could ride as well as anybody that ever was. They argued and tried to keep him out, but he wouldn't listen, and the whole show come to a standstill. Then the people begun to holler at him and make fun of him, and that made him mad, and he begun to rip and tear. So that stirred up the people and a lot of men began to pile down off of the benches and swarm towards the ring, saying, "'Knock him down! Throw him out!' And one or two women begun to scream. So then the ringmaster he made a little speech, and said he hoped there wouldn't be no disturbance, and if the man would promise he would make no more trouble, he would let him ride if he thought he could stay on the horse. So everybody laughed, said all right, and the man got on. The minute he was on, the horse begun to rip and tear and jump and convort around, with two circus men hanging on to his bridle trying to hold him, and the drunk man hanging on to his neck, and his heels flying in the air every jump, and the whole crowd of people standing up shouting and laughing till tears rolled down. And at last, sure enough, all the circus men could do, the horse broke loose, and away he went like the very nation round and round the ring, with that sot laying down on him and hanging to his neck, with first one leg hanging most to the ground on one side, and then the other one on the other side, and the people just crazy. It warn't funny to me, though. I was all of a tremble to see his danger. But pretty soon he struggled up a straddle and grabbed the bridle, a reeling this way and that. And the next minute he sprung up and dropped the bridle and stood. And the horse a-going like a house of fire, too. He just stood up there, a-sailing around as easy and comfortable as if he weren't ever drunk in his life. And then he begun to pull off his clothes and sling them. He shed them so thick they kind of clogged up the air. And altogether he shed seventeen suits. And then there he was, slim and handsome, and dressed the gaudiest and prettiest you ever saw, and he lit into that horse with his whip and made him fairly hum, and finally skipped off and made his bow and danced off to the dressing-room, and everybody just a howling with pleasure and astonishment. Then the ringmaster he see how he had been fooled, and he was the sickest ringmaster you ever see, I reckon. Why, it was one of his own men. He had got up that joke all out of his own head, and never let on to nobody. Well, I felt sheepish enough to be took in so, but I wouldn't have been in that ringmaster's place, not for a thousand dollars. I don't know. There may be bullier circuses than what that one was, but I never struck them yet. Anyways, it was plenty good enough for me, and wherever I run across it, it can have all of my custom every time. Well, that night we had our show, but there weren't only about twelve people there, just enough to pay expenses, and they laughed all the time, and that made the Duke mad, and everybody left anyway before the show was over but one boy which was asleep. So the Duke said these Arkansas lunkheads couldn't come up to Shakespeare. What they wanted was low comedy and maybe something rather worse than low comedy, he reckoned. He said he could size their style. So next morning he got some big sheets of wrapping paper and some black paint, 
and drawed off some handbills and stuck them up all over the village. The bills said, At the courthouse, for three nights only, the world-renowned tragedians David Garrick the Younger and Edmund Kane the Elder, of the London and Continental Theatres, in their thrilling tragedy of The King's Camel Leopard, or The Royal Nonsuch, admission fifty cents. Then at the bottom was the biggest line of all, which said, Ladies and children not admitted. There, says he, if that line don't fetch em, I don't know Arkansas. End of chapter. Chapter 23 Well, all day him and the king was hard at it, rigging up a stage and a curtain and a row of candles for footlights, and that night the house was jam full of men in no time. When the place couldn't hold no more, the duke he quit tendin' door and went around the back way and come on to the stage and stood up before the curtain and made a little speech and praised up this tragedy and said it was the most thrillingest one that ever was and so he went on a bragging about the tragedy and about edmund kane the elder which was to play the main principal part in it and at last when he got everybody's expectations up high enough he rolled up the curtain and the next minute the king come a-prancing out on all fours naked and he was painted all over ring streaked and striped all sorts of colors as splendid as a rainbow and but never mind the rest of his outfit it was just wild but it was awful funny the people most killed themselves laughing and when the king got done capering and capered off behind the scenes they roared and clapped and stormed and haw-hawed till he come out and done it over again and after that they made him do it another time well, it would make a cow laugh to see the shines that old idiot cut. Then the duke, he lets the curtain down, and bows to the people, and says the great tragedy will be performed only two nights more, on account of pressing London engagements, where the seats is all sold already for it in Drury Lane, and then he makes them another bow, and says if he has succeeded in pleasing them and instructing them, he will be deeply obliged if they will mention it to their friends and get them to come and see it. Twenty people sings out, What? Is it over? Is that all? The Duke says yes. Then there was a fine time. Everybody sings out, Sold! and rose up mad and was going for that stage and them tragedians. But a big, fine-looking man jumps up on a bench and shouts, Hold on! Just a word, gentlemen! They stop to listen. We are sold, mighty badly sold, but we don't want to be the laughing stock of this whole town, I reckon, and never hear the last of this thing as long as we live. No! What we want is to go out of here quiet, and talk this show up, and sell the rest of the town. Then we'll all be in the same boat. Ain't that sensible? You bet it is. The judge is right. Everybody sings out. All right, then. Not a word about any sell. Go along home and advise everybody to come and see the tragedy. Next day you couldn't hear nothing around that town but how splendid that show was. House was jammed again that night, and we sold this crowd the same way. When me and the king and the duke got home to the raft, we all had a supper, and by and by, about midnight, they made Jim and me back her out and float her down the middle of the river, and fetch her in and hide her about two mile below town. The third night the house was crammed again, and they weren't newcomers this time, but people that was at the show the other two nights. I stood by the duke at the door and I see that every man that went in had his pockets bulging, or something muffled up under his coat, and I see it wa'n't no perfumery neither, not by a long sight. I smelt sickly eggs by the barrel, and rotten cabbages and such things, and if I know the signs of a dead cat being around, and I bet I do, 
There was sixty-four of them went in. I shoved in there for a minute, but it was too various for me. I couldn't stand it. Well, when the place couldn't hold no more people, the Duke he give a fellow a quarter and told him to tend door for him a minute, and then he started around for the stage door, I after him. But the minute we turned the corner and was in the dark, he says, Walk fast now, till you get away from the houses, and then shin for the raft like the Dickens was after you. I done it, and he done the same. We struck the raft at the same time, and in less than two seconds we was gliding downstream, all dark and still, and edging towards the middle of the river, nobody saying a word. I reckon the poor king was in for a gaudy time of it with the audience, but nothing of the sort. Pretty soon he crawls out from under the wigwam and says, Well, how'd the old thing pound out this time, Duke? He hadn't been uptown at all. We never showed a light till we was about ten mile below the village. Then we lit up and had a supper, and the king and the duke fairly laughed their bones loose over the way they'd serve them people. The duke says, Greenhorns, flatheads, I knew the first house would keep mum and let the rest of the town get roped in, and I knew they'd lay for us the third night, and consider it was their turn now. Well, it is their turn, and I'd give something to know how much they'd take for it. I would just like to know how they're putting in their opportunity. They can turn it into a picnic if they want to. They brought plenty provisions. Them rapscallions took in four hundred and sixty-five dollars in that three nights. I never see money hauled in by the wagon load like that before. By and by, when they was asleep and snoring, Jim says, "'Don't it surprise you the way dem kings carries on, Huck?' "'No,' I says. "'It don't.' "'Why don't it, Huck?' "'Well, it don't, because it's in the breed. I reckon they're all alike.' "'But, Huck, these kings are and as regular rapscallions. Does just what they is. They's regular rapscallions.' "'Well, that's what I'm a-sayin'. All kings is mostly rapscallions, as fur as I can make out. Is that so? You read about them once, you'll see. Look at Henry the Eighth. This is a Sunday school superintendent to him. And look at Charles Second, and Louis Fourteen, and Louis Fifteen, and James Second, and Edward Second, and Richard Third, and forty more besides all them Saxon heptarchies that used to rip around so in old times and raise Cain. My, you ought to seen old Henry the Eight when he was in bloom. He was a blossom. He used to marry a new wife every day and chop off her head next morning, and he would do it just as indifferent as if he were ordering up eggs. Fetch up Nell Gwen, he says. They fetch her up. Next morning chop off her head, and they chop it off. Fetch up Jane Shore, he says, and up she comes. Next morning, chop off her head, and they chop it off. Ring up Fair Rossamoon. Fair Rossamoon answers the bell. Next morning, chop off her head, and he made every one of them tell a tale every night, and he kept that up till he had hogged a thousand and one tales that way and then he put them all in a book, and called it Domesday Book, which was a good name, and stated the case. You don't know kings, Jim, but I know them, and this old rip of iron is one of the cleanest I've struck in history. Well, Henry, he takes a notion he wants to get up some trouble with his country. How does he go at it? Give notice? Give the country a show? No! All of a sudden he heaves all the tea in Boston Harbor overboard, and whacks out a declaration of independence, and dares them to come on. That was his style. He never give anybody a chance. He had suspicions of his father, the Duke of Wellington. Well, what did he do? Ask him to show up? No. Drowned him in a butt of mamsey, like a cat. Suppose people left money laying around where he was. What did he do? He collared it. 
Suppose he contracted to do a thing, and you paid him, and didn't set down there and see that he'd done it. What did he do? He always done the other thing. Suppose he opened his mouth. What then? If he didn't shut it up powerful quick, he'd lose a lie every time. That's the kind of a bug Henry was, and if we'd a had him along instead of our kings, he'd a fooled that town a heap worse than ours done. I don't say that ourn is lambs, because they ain't when you come right down to the cold facts, but they ain't nothing to that old ram anyway. All I say is, kings is kings, and you got to make allowances. Take them all around, they're a mighty ornery lot. It's the way they're raised. But this one do smell so like the nation, Huck. Well, they all do, Jim. We can't help the way a king smells. History don't tell no way. Now the Duke, he's a tolerable likely man in some ways. Yes, a Duke's different, but not very different. This one's a middlin' hard lot for a Duke. When he's drunk there ain't no near-sighted man could tell him from a king. Well, anyways, I don't hanker for no more of em, Huck. These is all I can stand. It's the way I feel, too, Jim. But we've got them on our hands, and we got to remember what they are, and make allowances. Sometimes I wish I could hear of a country that's out of kings. What was the use to tell Jim these weren't real kings and dukes? It wouldn't have done no good. And besides, it was just as I said. You couldn't tell them from the real kind. I went to sleep, and Jim didn't call me when it was my turn. He often done that. When I waked up just at daybreak, he was sitting there with his head down betwixt his knees, moaning and mourning to himself. I didn't take notice nor let on. I knowed what it was about. He was thinking about his wife and his children, away up yonder. He was low and homesick because he had never been away from home before in his life. And I do believe he cared just as much for his people as white folks does for theirn. It don't seem natural, but I reckon it's so. He was often moaning and mourning that way nights, when he judged I was asleep, and saying, Poor little Lisbeth, poor little Johnny, it's mighty hard. I expect I ain't ever going to see you no more, no more. He was a mighty good nigger, Jeb was. But this time I somehow got to talking to him about his wife and young ones, and by and by he says, What makes me feel so bad this time is because I hear something over yonder on the bank like a whack, or a slam, while ago. And it mind me of the time I treat my little Lisbeth so ornery. She warn't only about four year old, and she took the scarlet fever and had a powerful rough spell, but she got well. And one day she was a standin' around, and I says to her, I says, "Shut the door." She never done it; just stood there, kind of smilin' up at me. It make me mad. And I says again, mighty loud, I says, Don't you hear me? Shut the door. She just stood the same way, kind of smiling up. I was a boiling. I says, I lay I make you mine. And with that, I fetch her a slap side the head that sought her a sprawling. Then I went into the other room and is gone about ten minutes. And when I come back, there was that door a standin' open yet, and that child standin' most right in it, a lookin' down and mournin', and the tears runnin' down. My, but I was mad. I was a goin' for the child, but just then, it was a door that opened in its. Just then, long come the wind and slams it too, behind the child, kerblam. In my land, the child never move. My breath most hop out of me, and I feel so, so, I don't know how I feel. I crope out all a-tremblin', 
and crope around and open the door easy and slow, and poke my head in behind the child soft and still, and all of a sudden I says, POW! just as loud as I could yell. She never budge. Oh, Huck, I bust out a crying and grab her up in my arms and say, Oh, the poor little thing, the Lord God Almighty forgive poor old Jim, cause he's never going to forgive himself as long as he's alive. Oh, she was plumb deef and dumb, Huck, plumb deef and dumb, and I've been a-treatin' her so. End of chapter. In chapter 24 Next day, towards night, we laid up under a little willow towhead out in the middle, where there was a village on each side of the river, and the duke and the king begun to lay out a plan for working them towns. Jim, he spoke to the duke, and said he hoped it wouldn't take but a few hours, because it got mighty heavy and tiresome to him when he had to lay all day in the wigwam tied with a rope. You see, when we left him all alone we had to tie him, because if anybody happened on to him all by himself and not tied, it wouldn't look much like he was a runaway nigger, you know. So the duke said it was kind of hard to have to lay roped all day, and he'd cipher out some way to get around it. He was uncommon bright, the duke was, and he soon struck it. He dressed Jim up in King Lear's outfit. It was a long curtain calico gown, and a white horsehair wig and whiskers, and then he took his theater paint and painted Jim's face and hands and ears and neck all over a dead, dull, solid blue, like a man that's been drowned nine days. Blamed if he wasn't the horriblest looking outrage I ever see. Then the duke took and wrote out a sign on a shingle so. Sick Arab, but harmless when not out of his head. And he nailed that shingle to a lath, and stood the lath up four or five foot in front of the wigwam. Jim was satisfied. He said it was a sight better than lying tied a couple of years every day, and trembling all over every time there was a sound. The duke told him to make himself free and easy, and if anybody ever come meddling around, he must hop out of the wigwam and carry on a little, and fetch a howl or two like a wild beast, and he reckoned they would light out and leave him alone. Which was sound enough judgment. But you take the average man, and he wouldn't wait for him to howl. Why, he didn't only look like he was dead, he looked considerable more than that. These rapscallions wanted to try the non-such again, because there was so much money in it, but they judged it wouldn't be safe, because maybe the news might have worked along down by this time. They couldn't hit no project that suited exactly, so at last the duke said he reckoned he'd lay off and work his brains an hour or two, and see if he couldn't put up something on the Arkansas village and the king he allowed he would drop over to the other village without any plan, but just trust in Providence to lead him the profitable way, meaning the devil, I reckon. We had all bought store clothes where we stopped last, and now the king put his on, he told me to put mine on. I'd done it, of course. The king's duds was all black, and he did look real swell and starchy. I never knowed how clothes could change a body before, why, before, he looked like the ornerest old rip that ever was, but now, when he'd take off his new white beaver and make a bow and do a smile, he looked that grand and good and pious that you'd say he had walked right out of the ark, and maybe was old Leviticus himself. Jim cleaned up the canoe, and I got my paddle ready. There was a big steamboat laying over the shore way up under the point, about three mile above the town, been there a couple of hours taken on freight. Says the king, Seein' how I'm dressed, I reckon maybe I better arrive down from St. Louis or Cincinnati or some other big place. Go for the steamboat, Huckleberry. We'll come down to the village on her. I didn't have to be ordered twice to go and take a steamboat ride. I fetched the shore a half a mile above the village, 
and then went scootin' along the bluff bank in the easy water. Pretty soon we come to a nice, innocent-lookin' young country Jake, sittin' on a log, swabbin' the sweat off of his face, for it was powerful warm weather, and he had a couple of big carpet-bags by him. "'Runner nose in shore,' says King. "'I done it. "'Where are you bound for, young man?' "'For the steamboat, going to Orleans.' "'Get aboard,' says the king. "'Hold on a minute. "'My servant'll help you with them bags. "'Jump out and help the gentleman at office. "'Meaning me, I see.' "'I done so, and then we all three started on again. "'The young chap was mighty thankful, "'saying it was tough work toting his baggage such weather. He asked the king where he was going, and the king told him he'd come down the river and landed at the other village this morning, and now he was going up a few miles to see an old friend on a farm up there. The young fellow says, When I first see you, I says to myself, It's Mr. Wilkes, sure, and he come mighty near getting here in time. But then I says, No, I reckon it ain't him, or else he wouldn't be paddling up the river. You ain't him, are you? No, my name's Blodgett. Alexander Blodgett. Reverend Alexander Blodgett, I suppose I must say, as I'm one of the Lord's poor servants. But still I just as able to be sorry for Mr. Wilkes for not arriving in time, all the same, if he's missed anything by it, which I hope he hasn't. Well, he don't miss any property by it, because he'll get that all right. But he's missed seeing his brother Peter die, which he mayn't mind. Nobody can tell as to that. But his brother would have give anything in this world to see him before he died. Never talked about nothing else all these three weeks. Hadn't seen him since they was boys together, and hadn't ever seen his brother William at all. That's the deep and dumb one. William ain't more than thirty or thirty-five. Peter and George were the only ones that come out here. George was the married brother. Him and his wife both died last year. Harvey and William's the only ones that's left now, and, as I was saying, they haven't got here in time. Did anybody send him word? Oh, yes, about a month or two ago, when Peter was first took. "'because Peter said then that he sort of felt like he weren't going to get well this time. "'You see, he was pretty old, and George's girls were too young to be much company for him, "'except Mary Jane, the red-headed one. "'And so he was kind of lonesome after George and his wife died, "'and didn't seem to care much to live. "'He most desperately wanted to see Harvey, and William too, for that matter, "'because he was one of them kind that can't bear to make a will.' He left a letter behind for Harvey, and said he'd told in it where his money was hid, and how he wanted the rest of the property divided up so George's girls would be all right, for George didn't leave nothing. And that letter was all they could get him to put a pen to. "'Why do you reckon Harvey don't come? Where does he live?' "'Oh, he lives in England. Sheffield. Preaches there. Hasn't ever been in this country.' He hadn't had any too much time, and besides he mightn't have got the letter at all, you know. Too bad, too bad he couldn't have lived to see his brother's poor soul. You going to Orleans, you say? Yes, but that ain't only a part of it. I'm going in a ship next Wednesday for Rio Janeiro, where my uncle is. It's a pretty long journey, but it'll be lovely. Wished I was a-going. Is Mary Jane the oldest? How old is the others? Mary Jane's nineteen, Susan's fifteen, and Joanna's about fourteen. That's the one that gives herself the good works and has a hair lip. Poor things, to be left alone in the cold world so. Well, they could be worse off. Old Peter had friends, and they ain't going to let them come to no harm. There's Hobson, the Baptist preacher, and Deacon Lot Hove, and Ben Rucker, and Abner Shackelford, and Levi Bell, the lawyer, and Dr. Robinson and their wives, and the widow Bartley, and, oh, well, there's a lot of them, but these are the ones that Peter was thickest with, 
and used to write about sometimes when he wrote home. So Harvey'll know where to look for friends when he gets here. Well, the old man went on asking questions till he just fairly emptied that young fellow. Blamed if he didn't inquire about everybody and everything in that blessed town, and all about the Wilkeses, and about Peter's business, which was a tanner, and about George's, which was a carpenter, and about Harvey's, which was a dissentering minister, and so on, and so on. Then he says, "'What did you want to walk all the way up to the steamboat for?' "'Because she's a big old Leans boat, and I was feared she mightn't stop there. When they're deep they won't stop for a hail. A Cincinnati boat will, but this is a St. Louis one.' "'Was Peter Wilkes well off?' "'Oh, yes, pretty well off. He had houses and land, and it's reckoned he left three or four thousand in cash hid up somewheres. When did you say he died? I didn't say, but it was last night. Funeral tomorrow, likely. Yes, about the middle of the day. Well, it's all terrible sad, but we've all got to go one time or another. So what we want to do is to be prepared, then we're all right. Yes, sir, it's the best way. Ma used to always say that. When we struck the boat she was about done loading, and pretty soon she got off. The king never said nothing about going aboard, so I lost my ride after all. When the boat was gone the king made me paddle up another mile to a lonesome place, and then he got ashore and says, Now hustle back right off, and fetch the duke up here, and the new carpet bags. And if he's gone over to the other side, go over there and get him, and tell him to get himself up regardless. Shove along now. I could see what he was up to, but I never said nothing, of course. When I got back with the duke we hid the canoe, and then they sat down on a log, and the king told him everything, just like the young fellow had said it, every last word of it. And all the time he was a-doin' it he tried to talk like an Englishman, and he done it pretty well, too, for slouch. Ah, I can't imitate him, and so I ain't a-goin' to try to. But he really done it pretty good. Then he says, "'How are you on the deef and dumb, Bilgewater?' The Duke said, "'Leave him alone for that,' said he had played a deef and dumb person on the histrionic boards. So then they waited for a steamboat. About the middle of the afternoon a couple of little boats come along, but they didn't come from high enough up the river. But at last there was a big one, and they hailed her. She sent out her yawl, and we went aboard, and she was from Cincinnati, and when they found we only wanted to go four or five mile they was booming mad, and gave us a cussin, and said they wouldn't land us. But the king was calm, he says. If gentlemen can afford to pay a dollar a mile apiece to be took on and put off in a yawl, a steamboat can afford to carry em, can't it? So they softened down and said it was all right, and when we got to the village they yawled us ashore. About two dozen men flocked down when they see the yawl a coming, and when the king says, Can any of you gentlemen tell me where Mr. Peter Wilkes lives? They give a glance at one another and nodded their heads as much as to say, "'What did I tell you?' Then one of them says, kind of soft and gentle, "'I'm sorry, sir, but the best we can do is to tell you where he did live yesterday evening.' Sudden as winking, the owner old creature went on to smash, and fell up against the man, and put his chin on his shoulder, and cried down his back, and says, Oh, alas, alas, our poor brother, gone, and we never got to see him. Oh, it's too, too hard. Then he turns around, blubbering, and makes a lot of idiotic signs to the duke on his hands, and blamed if he didn't drop a carpet bag and bust out a crying. If they weren't the beatenest lot, them two frauds, that ever I struck. Well, the men gathered round and sympathized with them, and said all sorts of kind things to them, and carried their carpet-bags up the hill for them, 
and let them lean on them and cry, and told the king all about his brother's last moments, and the king he told it all over again on his hands to the duke, and both of them took on about that dead tanner like they'd lost the twelve disciples. Well, if ever I struck anything like it, I'm a nigger. It was enough to make a body ashamed of the human race. End of chapter Chapter 25 The news was all over town in two minutes, and you could see the people tearing down on the run from every which way, some of them putting on their coats as they come. Pretty soon we was in the middle of a crowd, and the noise of the tramping was like a soldier march. The windows and dooryards was full, and every minute somebody would say over a fence, "'Is it them?' and somebody trotting along with the gang would answer back and say, "'You bet it is!' When we got to the house the street in front of it was packed, and the three girls were standing in the door. Mary Jane was red-headed, but that don't make no difference. She was most awful beautiful, and her face and her eyes were all lit up like glory. She was so glad her uncles was come. The king he spread his arms, and Mary Jane she jumped for them, and the hare lip jumped for the duke, and there they had it. Everybody most, leastways women, cried for joy to see them meet again at last and have such good times. Then the king he hunched the duke private, I see him do it, and then he looked around and see the coffin over in the corner on two chairs, so then him and the duke, with a hand across each other's shoulder, and to other hand to the eyes, walked slow and solemn over there, everybody dropping back to give them room, and all the talk and noise stopping, people saying shh, and all the men taking their hats off and drooping their heads, so you could have heard a pin fall. And when they got there they bent over and looked in the coffin and took one sight, and then they bust out a-crying so you could have heard them to Orleans most and then they put their arms around each other's necks, and hung their chins over each other's shoulders, and then for three minutes, or maybe four, I'd never seen two men leak the way they done. And mind you, everybody was doing the same, and the place was that damp I'd never see anything like it. Then one of them got on one side of the coffin, and the other on the other side, and they kneeled down and rested their foreheads on the coffin, and led on to pray all to themselves. Well, when it come to that it worked the crowd like you never see anything like it, and everybody broke down and went to sobbing right out loud. The poor girls, too, and every woman, nearly, went up to the girls, without saying a word, and kissed them solemn on the forehead, and then put their hand on their head, and looked up towards the sky with the tears running down and then busted out and went off sobbing and swabbing, and give the next woman a show. I never see anything so disgusting. Well, by and by the king he gets up and comes forward a little, and works himself up and slobbers out a speech, all full of tears and flap-doodle, about its being a sore trial for him and his poor brother to lose the diseased, and to miss seeing diseased alive after the long journey of four thousand mile. But it's a trial that's sweetened and sanctified to us by this dear sympathy and these holy tears, and so he thanks them out of his heart and out of his brother's heart, because out of their mouths they can't, words being too weak and cold, and all that sort of rot and slush, till it was just sickening and then he blubbers out a pious goody-goody amen, and turns himself loose and goes to crying fit to bust. And the minute the words were out of his mouth, somebody over in the crowd struck up the doxologer, and everybody joined in with all their might, and it just warmed you up and made you feel as good as church letting out. Music is a good thing, and after all that soul butter and Hogwash, I never see it freshen up things so, and sound so honest and bully. Then the king begins to work his jaw again, and says how him and his nieces would be glad if a few of the main principal friends of the family 
would take supper here with them this evening, and help set up with the ashes of the diseased, and says if his poor brother lay in yonder could speak, he knows who he would name, for they was names that was very dear to him, and mentioned often in his letters, and so he will name the same, to wit, as follows, viz. Reverend Mr. Hobson, and Deacon Lot Hovey, and Mr. Ben Rucker, and Abner Shackelford, and Levi Bell, and Dr. Robinson, and their wives, and the widow Bartley. Reverend Hobson and Dr. Robinson was down to the end of the town a-hunting together. That is, I mean the doctor was shipping a sick man to the other world, and the preacher was pointing him right. Lawyer Bell was away up to Louisville on business, but the rest was on hand, and so they all come and shook hands with the king, and thanked him, and talked to him, and then they shook hands with the duke, and didn't say nothing, but just kept a smiling and bobbing their heads like a passel of sap heads, while he made all sorts of signs with his hands, and said, Goo, 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 all the time, like a baby that can't talk. So the king he blattered along, and managed to inquire about pretty much everybody and dog in town by his name, and mentioned all sorts of little things that happened one time or another in the town, or to George's family, or to Peter. And he always let on that Peter wrote him the things, but that was a lie. He got every blessed one of them out of that young flathead that we canoed up to the steamboat. Then Mary Jane she fetched the letter her father left behind, and the king he read it out loud and cried over it. It give the dwelling house and three thousand dollars gold to the girls, and it give the tan yard, which was doing a good business, along with some other houses and land worth about seven thousand, and three thousand dollars in gold to Harvey and William, and told where the six thousand cash was hid down cellar. So these two frauds said they'd go and fetch it up, and have everything square and above board, and told me to come with a candle. We shut the cellar door behind us, and when they found the bag they spilled it out on the floor, and it was a lovely sight, all them yeller boys. My, the way the king's eyes did shine! He slaps the duke on the shoulder and says, Oh, this ain't bullin' nor nothin'. Oh, no, I reckon not. Why, Billy, it beats the nun such, don't it? The duke allowed it did. They pawed the yaller boys, and sifted them through their fingers, and let them jingle down on the floor. And the king says, It ain't no use talkin', being brothers to a rich dead man, and representatives of fur and heirs that got's left is the line for you and me, Bilge. This year comes of trustin' to Providence. It's the best way in the long run. I've tried em all, and there ain't no better way. Most everybody would have been satisfied with the pile, and took it on trust, but no, they must count it. So they counts it, and it comes out four hundred and fifteen dollars short, says the king. Durn him, I wonder what he done with that four hundred and fifteen dollar. They worried over that a while, and ransacked all around for it. Then the duke says, Well, he was a pretty sick man, and likely he made a mistake. I reckon that's the way of it. The best way is to let it go, and keep still about it. We can spare it. Oh, shucks, yes, we can spare it. I don't care nothing about that. It's the count I'm thinking about. We want to be awful square and open above board here, you know. We want to lug this here money upstairs and count it before everybody. Then there ain't nothing suspicious. But when the dead man says the six thousand dollars, you know, we don't want to— Hold on, says the duke. Let's make up the deficit, and he begun to haul out yaller boys out of his pocket. It's a most amazing good idea, Duke. You have got a rattling clever head on you, says the king. Blessed if the old nonsuch ain't a helping us out again. And he begun to haul out yaller jackets and stack them up. It most busted them, but they made up the six thousand clean and clear. Say, says the duke, I've got another idea. Let's go upstairs and count this money, and then take and give it to the girls. Good land, Duke, let me hug you. It's the most dazzling idea that ever a man struck. You have certainly got the most astonishing head I ever see. 
Oh, this is the boss dodge. There ain't no mistake about it. Let em fetch along their suspicions now if they want to. This'll lay em out. When we got upstairs, everybody gathered round the table, and the king he counted it and stacked it up, three hundred dollars in a pile, twenty elegant little piles. Everybody looked hungry at it, and licked their chops. Then they raked it into the bag again, and I see the king begin to swell himself up for another speech. He says, "'Friends all, my poor brother that lays yonder has done generous by them that's left behind in the vale of sorrows. He has done generous by these year poor little lambs that he loved and sheltered, and that's left fatherless and motherless. Yes, and we that knowed him knowed that he would have done more generous by them if he hadn't been afeard of wounding his dear William and me. Now, wouldn't he? There ain't no question about it in my mind. Well, then, what kind of brothers would it be that'd stand in his way at such a time? And what kind of uncles would it be that'd rob, yes, rob, such poor sweet lambs as these that he loves so at such a time? If I know William, and I think I do, he, well, I'll just ask him. He turns around and begins to make a lot of signs to the Duke with his hands, and the Duke he looks at him stupid and leather-headed a while. Then all of a sudden he seems to catch his meaning, and jumps for the King, goo-gooing with all his might for joy, and hugs him about fifteen times before he lets up. Then the King says, I knowed it. I reckon that'd convince anybody the way he feels about it. Here, Mary Jane, Susan, Joanna, take the money. Take it all. It's the gift to him that lays yonder, cold but joyful. Mary Jane, she went for him. Susan and the hair lip went for the Duke, and then such another hugging and kissing I never see yet. And everybody crowded up with the tears in their eyes, and most shook the hands off of them frauds, saying all the time, "'You dear good souls! How lovely! How could you!' Well, then, pretty soon all hands got to talking about the diseased again, and how good he was, and what a loss he was, and all that. And before long a big iron-jawed man worked himself in there from outside, and stood a-listening and looking, and not saying anything, and nobody saying anything to him either, because the king was talking, and they was all busy listening. The king was saying, in the middle of something he'd started in on, "'They being particular friends of the diseased. That's why they're invited here this evening. But tomorrow we want all to come, everybody, for he respected everybody, he liked everybody, and so it's fitting that his funeral orgies should be public. And so he went a-moonin' on and on, likin' to hear himself talk. And every little while he fetched in his funeral orgies again, till the Duke he couldn't stand it no more, and he writes on a little scrap of paper, Hopsequies, you old fool, and folds it up and goes to goo-gooin' and reachin' it over people's heads to him. The king he reads it, and puts it in his pocket, and says, Poor William, afflicted as he is, his heart's always right. Asks me to invite everybody to come to the funeral. Wants me to make em all welcome. But he needn't a worried it was just what I was at. Then he weaves along again, perfectly calm, and goes to droppin' in his funeral orgies again every now and then, just like he'd done before, and when he'd done it the third time, he says, I say orgies, not because it's the common term, because it ain't, obsequies being the common term, but because orgies is the right term. Obsequies ain't used in England no more now, it's gone out. We say orgies now in England. Orgies is better, because it means the thing you're after more exact. It's a word that's made up out of the Greek orgo outside, open, abroad, and the Hebrew jesum, to plant, cover up, hence inter. So, you see, funeral orgies as an open or public funeral. He was the worst I ever struck. Well, the iron job man, he laughed right in his face. Everybody was shocked. Everybody says, Why, doctor! And Abner Shackleford says, 
Why, Robinson, hain't you heard the news? This is Harvey Wilkes. The king he smiled eager, shoved out his flapper, and says, Is it my poor brother's dear good friend and physician? I keep your hands off of me, says the doctor. You talk like an Englishman, don't you? It's the worst imitation I ever heard. You, Peter Wilkes' brother. You're a fraud, that's what you are. Well, how they all took on. They crowded round the doctor and tried to quiet him down, and tried to explain to him and tell him how Harvey had showed in forty ways that he was Harvey, and knowed everybody by name, and the names of the very dogs, and begged and begged him not to hurt Harvey's feelings and the poor girl's feelings and all that. But it wa'n't no use. He stormed right along, and said any man that pretended to be an Englishman and couldn't imitate the lingo no better than what he did was a fraud and a liar. The poor girls was hanging to the king and crying, and all of a sudden the doctor ups and turns on them. He says, I was your father's friend, and I'm your friend, and I warn you as a friend, and an honest one that wants to protect you and keep you out of harm and trouble. To turn your backs on that scoundrel and have nothing to do with him, the ignorant tramp, with his idiotic Greek and Hebrew, as he calls it, he is the thinnest kind of an impostor, has come here with a lot of empty names and facts which he picked up somewheres, and you take them for proofs, and are helped to fool yourselves by these foolish friends here who ought to know better. Mary Jane Wilkes, you know me for your friend, and for your unselfish friend, too. Now listen to me. Turn this pitiful rascal out. I beg you to do it. Will you? Mary Jane straightened herself up, and, my, but she was handsome. She says, Here is my answer. She hove up the bag of money and put it in the king's hands, and says, Take this six thousand dollars and invest it for me and my sisters any way you want to, and don't give us no receipt for it. Then she put her arm around the king on one side, and Susan and the hare lip done the same on the other. Everybody clapped their hands and stomped on the floor like a perfect storm, whilst the king held up his head and smiled proud. The doctor says, All right, I wash my hands of the matter, but I warn you all that a time's coming when you're going to feel sick whenever you think of this day. And away he went. All right, doctor, says the king, kind of mocking him. We'll try and get em to send for you which made them all laugh, and they said it was a prime good hit. End of chapter.